Okay. We're in Acts chapter 2. We're going to finish Acts chapter 2 as the plan tonight. We will not be in chapter 3. We'll get to chapter 3 next week. Um, by the way, the, the, we're trying to start a policy here at Central that if we do a fifth Sunday meal, we don't do a first Wednesday meal. So we will have class next week, even though it's a first Wednesday because we're having a potluck after lunch or after services this Sunday, so everybody can eat for that. Um, some of us can't resist eating too much, so we're trying to avoid the first possibility of doing it. Now, really, it's just we've got another meal coming up, harvest meal coming up the 19th, I believe it is, that Saturday before Thanksgiving. So we got enough eating to do. Let's pray before we get started. God, thank you for this afternoon. Thank you for caring for us the way you do. God, I pray that you'd be with Teresa and with Bob and Susan as they're traveling this week. Pray that you keep all of them safe. Pray that you be with our class this evening and help us follow. Let your spirit guide us in our discussion as we continue to look at this early part of the church. Thank you for preserving this history for us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are... At the bottom of your page three, we talked last week, we ended the class by talking about the transformation we saw in Peter. And we talked about that, how before Christ was crucified, he's there saying, I don't know who he is, I don't, I don't know this guy. And here we are two months later, and it's he's standing up in front of the crowd, spouting his mouth off, bold as can be not afraid of anything. So we watched that transformation happen, not only with him, but of course at the crucifixion of Jesus, all the disciples fled, everybody ran, and here all of them were standing there in the temple courts preaching about Jesus. Holy Spirit's empowered them, Holy Spirit's emboldened them, taken their fear away, they now know the truth about what they're doing, and so they're boldly proclaiming who Christ is, and we got started last week looking at the beginning of the chapter, and now we're ready to get into Peter's first sermon, as we call it. Uh, he gets one in this chapter, and then we get one in chapter 3. I would encourage you to read ahead for chapter 3 next week, because one of the things I want us to do next week is compare the sermon in Acts chapter 2 with the sermon in Acts chapter 3, and see how they correspond to each other, see how they differ. Just to sort of look at how Peter's sermon's going along as he begins the gospel uh, sharing to all these people to get to know who Jesus is. So the first question we'll look at tonight on the handouts, uh, that bottom was there on page three of your handout, how does Peter structure his sermon to get the people to listen to him? Obviously there's this this is a wide open question and you can come up with all kinds of answers that you want. So what do you think? What does, what does Peter do to get the people to listen and then ultimately, as we know, to respond, many of them to say, what should we do about this? What does he do? He talks about the words of God. He also talks about the miracles of God. Right. He, praised, he praised God. Okay, he begins by talking about the miracles. They say, you know, God did through Jesus all these miracles and wonders. And he talks about, in essence, the scriptures. Say who Jesus is, why we can believe who he is. He appeals to who? Who's the two people he relates back to in the Old Testament? Who's he quote from? Quote from Joel. Quote from Joel 1, and who's the other one? Who else does he quote from Psalms? Yeah, who, yeah so who, who wrote that one? David. 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 Right? He says, you know, David lived and died in his tombs with us today, but he said, blah, blah, blah. So he appeals to Joel. It appeals to David. What would the Jews have thought when he appeals to Joel and David? Well, they know they know that. They yes. know the Old Testament. Absolutely. You know, we today, Christians, many of us, are pretty weak when it comes to Old Testament. We don't study it a whole lot. We don't delve into it very much. Most, I would say most, many Christians today think the Old Testament is a bunch of old junk. We don't need to pay attention to it anymore. That would not have been the Jews. The Jews in Acts chapter 2, many of them would have had the Old Testament memorized. <laughs> and so when Peter and the others stand up and start quoting 
Joel, one of their prophets, and David, the greatest king they're all looking back to, you don't get their attention. You know, what those two guys said is what we're watching here today. So he quotes the scripture. What else does he say? Talked about the church fellowship. I'm not there yet. He's not, not the sermon yet. That's the end of the chapter. What does he say in his sermon to get their attention and, and to make them believe what he's talking about? He compares the death of David to the death of Jesus. Okay, he draws that comparison. Quotes from says David said blah blah blah. Well, he's dead, and we know he's dead. His tomb's right here. So who's he talking about that doesn't corruption and he connects <coughs> it? to be Jesus. This Jesus who God raises from the dead. But there's one other point that he makes that I think to be reminded of as he's sharing with these people this story. Why does he tell them you need to believe what I'm telling you? I think Dick Miller question is right there in the answer. Yeah, it's on board now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving you some hullabaloo story of stuff that somebody told us that somebody told us that somebody told us. He said, we are I. And as he continues to speak, and Luke says, with many other words, he kept telling people about Jesus. Somewhere along the way, he said, we saw Jesus dead. We went to the tomb on Sunday to embalm him and do all this stuff, and he wasn't there. He rose from the dead, and we've seen him after that. We, he appeared to us. We touched him. We ate with him. We, we know this is true because we saw it happen. And it's, you know, a lot of the UFO stuff that Scott and I like to watch UFO stuff on TV. So-and-so told so-and-so, I'm watching something on the History Channel, talks about giants. And it's, it's a neat thing about all the, the burial places around the Mediterranean where they bury giants. <coughs> I'm watching this program, the one guy says, yeah, back in the 50s, we had all these stories about people digging up giants. We don't have any of their bones anymore. Somehow they've all just sort of disappeared. But we dug them up. And I'm thinking, yeah, right, sure you did. What happened to these bones that you supposedly dug up? Third-handed stories. Peter says, this isn't some third-hand story. We, 11 guys who are sitting here, 12 guys, who are standing up here telling you about this, we saw it. We saw Jesus. And of course, the crowd would have known because we're just too much away from this thing as a big hallelujah that Jesus got crucified. Yeah, I don't think that was done in private. It was done publicly. Everybody knew what was going on. So they knew this Jesus, who was all this rebel rousing stuff, got himself crucified. And now there's 12 people standing up there saying, He's not dead. We saw him alive. We ate with him. We did all this stuff. And we watched him go back to heaven. And so you can believe what I'm telling you because not only does it fulfill Joel and David and all these miracles we watched, you're talking to the people that actually saw Jesus walk on the earth after he died on that cross. That would probably get your attention. You know, much better than you know, so-and-so told me that they saw him, and I'm telling you what he said. That isn't the way this sermon goes. This sermon is, we saw him, we watched him, we are eyewitnesses of this, he says. What is happening here is really a fulfillment <coughs> of what Luke wrote in Luke chapter 24. He says this, this is, I don't know if I gave you this scripture or not. Yeah, I did. It's on your page, it's on your page four. You got it. Luke 24, 45 says, and then he opened their minds. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations.
beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And so as we watch these disciples doing that now, do you not have your hand out, Mom? I wasn't here last week when you asked them. That's a sorry excuse. <laughs> sorry excuse. I don't think I have another one. I can print one. <laughs> so Jesus is telling these disciples before he dies, I'm going to die. I'm going to come back to life. You're going to stay in Jerusalem and you're going to talk about this. And so that's what he, they do here. Notice he says you're going to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And it's going to begin there in Jerusalem. And that's what Peter and the others are doing right there in Acts chapter 2. They're fulfilling Jesus' prophecy to be involved in this. Let's read this sermon. You've got your Bibles with you. We're in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. <coughs> Peter stands up with the eleven and he says this. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. I still like Scott's observation. As I call this, just the ninth hour. It's not, they couldn't be drunk if it was six in the evening. We could very well be drunk. But we're not drunk now because it's just the ninth <coughs> morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Notice Peter says, I'm not telling you something you're not already aware of. Many of these people who are in Jerusalem know all about Jesus. They watched him teach and preach for three and a half years. They've watched the fights go on with the leaders and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the chief priests, all this stuff. And Peter says, you already know this stuff. I'm not telling you something you don't know. He says, this man was handed over to you by God, by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You will make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on a note that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, we have seen of the Father, promised Holy Spirit <coughs> poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That's a pretty powerful sermon. <coughs> you know, we could preach that sermon today. We couldn't very well cover the Jews. Well, most people won't know the Old Testament properly <coughs> well enough. But the rest of this sermon is what we should all be preaching. Jesus was raised by the power of God, is back in his right hand, and he sent his Holy Spirit to work his stuff here on earth with us. That's still the message of the gospel. That's still what you and I need to be sharing with people. Christ is not dead, he's alive. And if we can get people to believe that, that makes him different from every other supposed God that everybody's ever worshipped. 
because they've all died. If they died, they were buried, and they're done. It's all. You know, with what you said, and we're also raised by the power of God. Yes, we are too. Yes, and that's Paul's or Peter's point, and he'll cover that as he moves into the next few chapters. We've got that power. You and I, when we're buried with Christ in baptism, Paul says the same power that raised Christ from the dead works in our lives. I don't know about you, but that's pretty cool. That the power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead works in our life. His Holy Spirit is in us to help us do what God wants us to do. And that's what Peter's telling these people. The same Jesus who came back from the dead, that power is available. And you're seeing it right here. So who crucified Jesus, according to Peter? The Jews did. You know, there's a big movement today for all these good Christian folk to excuse the Jews, take the blame away from them, what your fault? That's not what Peter says here. Peter says, you people, with the help of wicked men, crucify them. The Jews couldn't do it, right? The Jews did not have their power or their authority to send his people to death. They had to go to Rome. Remember, that's why they go to Pilate. That's why they go to King Herod is to get someone to give them the authority to crucify Jesus because they didn't have that authority under the Roman Empire rules. They couldn't crucify anybody. And so Peter says, you guys, you, with the help of wicked men, some translations say unbelieving Gentiles, crucified Jesus. He'll get even more pointed in chapter 3. That's why I encourage you to go read chapter 3 for next week. And look at that sermon versus this one. He gets even more blunt. You guys wanted Barabbas to be released instead of Jesus. And so you crucified him. But he comes right to the point. He isn't giving these guys a pass. He isn't saying, you guys made a horrible mistake, and, and I know you didn't mean it. You guys crucified him. You took Jesus and killed him. And not only did you do it, you had to use these horrible, ungodly Gentiles to accomplish what you want to done. You know these Gentiles we don't associate with? These Gentiles we don't eat in the same house with? These Gentiles we avoid with all the power we've got to avoid? You guys went to them to get Jesus crucified. That's just almost salt in the wound. Because Jews and Gentiles didn't work together. They didn't cooperate well. And Peter says, you use them to accomplish your dirty deeds. And that's his sermon to these people. And these people are standing there listening to that. They've heard the mighty wind. They've watched these Galileans speak in languages that there's no way they should have been able to speak in. And yes, you can imagine they're pretty impressed by this. Thank you. Wow. So what do they do? What does the crowd do? The light bulbs turn on to say, yeah. what shall we do now? All right. Yeah. You know, it's the good answer. It's the good question. Okay, you've told us this. You think they believe what Peter said? Yeah, otherwise they wouldn't have asked that question. Of course, of course they believe. And some people will, will read this sermon, and this is how twisted some people will go to try to win a point. They will say, well, there's nothing in here about belief. There ain't anything in here that says these people believed on Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, what, are you just stupid or, or are you trying to act dumb? I mean, what, what's wrong with you? They wouldn't have said, what can you do? They would have been cut to the heart if they hadn't believed what Peter and those other apostles were telling them. You guys killed Jesus. The fulfillment of prophecy. The Messiah we've been waiting on for hundreds and hundreds of years. You people killed him. Of course they believed. That's why their heart was cut. That's why they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall they do about what? Well, if they're, they were unbelievers and now they believe, okay. then what do we do? Yeah, what do we do now that we're What's believers? What's the next step? Yes, and I think that's important, Emily, because a lot of other people teach, all you got to do is believe. Just believe. Just say the sinner's prayer. Ask Jesus into your heart and you're home free. <coughs> There isn't any sinner's prayer in Peter's sermon. 
The question is, once we believe, what do we do now? Peter does not say, with all eyes closed, all heads bowed. If you want to accept Jesus, raise your hand. And then repeat after me, I'm a sinner. I want Jesus to come into my life, and you're home free. That's it. That's what a lot of people teach. That is not what Peter said to do. And you won't find that answer anywhere in the book of Acts. There is nothing that ever says, when you come to believe in Jesus, close your eyes, raise your hand, say this little prayer. Here's what Peter says. What shall we do? Peter's response is the same then as it is today. He says in the scripture, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are for all, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Who does that include? Gentiles. Us, right? Everybody, us. All the way down. This promise is to us. If we will believe on Jesus Christ, Peter says, it's to you, your children, and to all who are far off. Well, we're about as far off as you can get from Jerusalem on this globe. If you come to believe in Jesus Christ, you can accept him as your Savior. How? By doing what Peter says. Repent and be baptized. And so the message that I think we need to be teaching when we talk to people about what do I need to do to be saved? I mean, that's a question sincere people ask even today. What do I need to do to be saved? Read Peter's sermon and read his response. And then look at this. you got to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, right? <laughs> Clearly these people did that. Not much of a doubt. They believe what Peter said because, as Debbie said, they're cut to their heart. They're asking, what are we going to do about this now? And the way Emily says it, now that I believe, what am I supposed to do next? You believe he died for your sins. That's the gist of the sermon, that Peter's sermon is. This Jesus, this prophet, this guy who we've witnessed, died for you people. You, in fact, killed him. Not because you got away with it, but because that was God's plan. And again, that's, a lot of people argue, well, see, it wasn't the Jews' fault. This was God's plan, and so that's just the way it went. But it was the Jews' fault. Repent of your sins and lifestyle. They, they, what you're repenting of, what are we repenting of? When Peter says repent, and be baptized. What am I repenting of? My life. How I live. Okay. How was I living? Your sinful not way. Not believing. Yeah. Okay. Not believing. That's part of it. What else? Forgiveness. You get forgiveness. Yes. Repentance isn't forgiveness yet. What does my life do? Change. Change. And we'll look at that here. Just say what repentance is. It isn't just saying. Well, I'm sorry I'm a sinner. Repentance requires you to change from one thing to another. And really what Peter, I think, is talking about is you need to change from not believing that Jesus is the Messiah and believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the change of life. And then if you do that, and look at this sermon on Sunday, if you make that change, your life reflects it. There's something in your life that shows I truly believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And so Peter says to these people who didn't believe in Jesus, you need to repent. Now that you do believe, stop not believing, start believing, get baptized. In other words, dip in that baptistry, get dunked in that water. Why? Because that's what God wants you to do. That's the command. Not, I don't know, <coughs> theological battles. You know, we talked about this a little, I think, last week. People argue, there it was Sunday morning. When am I saved? When do I get the gift of the Holy Spirit? Is it when I believe? Is it when I repent? Is it when I confess? Is it when I get baptized? When is it? And we can argue about that forever. But if you just do what Jesus and Peter here says to do, you don't have to worry about when that happens because you've covered all your bases. But there are a lot of people today, Protestant, good believing, honest, sincere people, who teach, all you got to do is believe and say that little sinner's prayer, and you're okay. And if you ever get around to be baptized, that's okay. But if you don't, that's okay too. 
because that doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. You can't read Acts chapter 2 and come to the conclusion that baptism doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. Because if you read Acts chapter 2, what does Peter say happens when you're baptized? What happens to us when we're baptized? According to Peter. We're cleansed from our sins. Yeah, we're cleansed from our sins are forgiven. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. So if I'm not baptized, there's a real good chance my sins haven't been forgiven. My sins haven't been washed away. And again, that's part of the baptism experience is a washing. Peter will say that in 1 Peter. He said baptism saves us, not because there's some magic in the water, but because it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. God says, do it. I'm going to do it. Why, why fight it? Why wait? Why not just do what God wants you to do? And if you'll do that, then you don't have to worry about, well, I saved when I believed. Did I get the Holy Spirit when I confessed? Doesn't make any difference. You've done it all. So you've got it, Paul. And what you got up there is just receive the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit within you. That's what Peter says. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that promise is for them and for all of us. So if you look through what happened here, and then we'll see here in a minute, then we've got to live right. And that's Debbie for you. There's a change in your life. If I'm going to stop living for me and not believe in Jesus, and I'm going to repent and turn to say, I do believe and I'm going to accept him as my Savior, my Christ, my Messiah, then my life is going to reflect that. And people are going to be able to see, by the way I live in my heart, that I believe this stuff. And if I'm going to live the same way I've always lived, I don't care about anybody else. It's all about me. And I got dumped in baptistry when I was 12. It's probably not doing you much good. And so, and we'll see that as we finish this chapter. It isn't just, okay, do this and then it's done and you know you'll do whatever you want to do. We finish the chapter and we see that these people have a lifestyle change. They lived differently after this summer than they did before. And I just think we don't necessarily cover that enough or stress that enough and there's a lot of teachings out there that totally ignore much of this because of what they've been taught. And again, I think they're sincere. I think they truly mm. believe what they're teaching us. But you've got to totally ignore your sermon in Acts chapter 2 to believe that baptism doesn't have something to do with your salvation. Peter makes it pretty clear that's what you got to do. And it'll go on to say, and 3,000 of them were baptized that day. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say something. Not to be hard to make. No, go ahead. Because I've, I've, you know, you start reading the New Testament, and all of a sudden this word baptized comes in in the gospel. But it's not in the Old Testament. Right. But there's no doubt that the gospel is, you can't doubt this is the word God says. He says that the gospel is to the Jews. But he said, go, this is, even that one lady, a Gentile, he said, you know, what, what do I have to do with the dogs? Right. Yeah. So, and Jesus plainly said, I baptize with the Holy Spirit. That's right. And Jesus soaked from my own blood in the water. Well, Jesus, I can only, I can only what Jesus body. says is, you can right. baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire. Right. Yeah. Okay. Then you can be baptized with a lot of things. You can. But, um, my experience in my family, my father, especially, I get tripped up. He came to know Jesus. And Jesus came into him when he confessed his sin and asked him to be his Savior. Okay? And uh, <coughs> if you go to, and, and like you said, and you said this Sunday, I think it's Sunday, you got to look at the context. You know, you've got to look at who's being talked to, yes. who, what, whatever. This was all Jewish here in the day of Pentecost. There were no Gentiles there. Well, there probably were yeah. some, but they were yeah. probably yeah. over here to Paul's gospel. Yeah. And he said, for Christ, sent me not to baptize. And here's he says, but to preach the gospel. The yeah. gospel means good news. It does. And you know, so then you get into these points where somebody says, okay, I'm, I'm witnessing to somebody on their point. Right. Okay. So you can look at the people on the cross, same thing. And this guy, and he really repents. He says, you know, I believe in your Savior. I believe in your Jesus. Sure. I accept Christ as my Savior. And he does it right there. <laughs> and that's between him and God. And then the plane crashes. Okay. Then you get baptized. Here, here's the answer to that little window before we move on from that. No, that's the whole thing. Right, you don't have to stop there, but let me just show you this. 
two things. One, the thief on the cross doesn't apply. He died before Christ instituted baptism. Okay, so he doesn't he doesn't he's count. Under he's, a, he's under the old law. He doesn't have to be baptized for remission of sins because he died under the law of Moses. Okay? Paul's comment of he didn't send me to baptize in the context, the argument Paul is making, people were arguing over, well, I'm a better Christian than you because I got baptized by Peter. I'm better than you because Paul baptized me. I'm better than you because Paul has baptized me. Paul says, I don't even want to get into this stupid argument. I'm glad I didn't baptize very many people. If it's going to lead to this argument of who baptized who makes you think you're better than anybody else. Paul doesn't say baptism is not important. And if you read Romans chapter 6, he says baptism is very important. That it's the death, burial, and resurrection commemorating what Jesus did for us. So you can't just read that one line. People said that line before. Paul said, I'm glad I didn't come that right. That's not what he says. If you read the context, what he's saying is the argument of who baptized who isn't important. It doesn't matter whether Shannon baptizes me or Emily baptizes me or John baptizes me. That doesn't make you any better Christian. That's what Paul's responding to there. But if you read the rest of his Gospels, he talks baptism many, many times. Many, many times to the Greeks. Mm -hmm. In fact, all the letters that we read Paul wrote after well, all of them wrote to God were written to Gentiles. And in almost every one of them, there's a reference to being baptized. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that yeah, these are primarily Jews here that Peter's talking to, because remember Jesus said before he ascended back to heaven, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. It starts here because they came to the Jews first. And Paul even says in another passage, <coughs> how good is it going to be a Jew then? Because the Jews are going to say, well, wait a minute, we've always been God's chosen people. Paul says, the neat thing about being a Jew is, you got to be first. God came to you first. Jesus came to you first. And Peter, or Paul, will even say, as the Jews reject him, fine, I've had it with you. I'm going to the Gentiles, which is where God sent me to go. But the guy on the plane, again, that's that old adage of hard cases make bad law. I don't know what happens to that guy. I'd like to believe, like you do, that God's grace is going to cover him and he's going to be okay. That's God's choice. But the answer that I always give when that question to ask is, that doesn't apply to you and me. Yeah. We're not on an airplane about to die. You and I have a chance to do it. That's a very good do. example. <coughs> he hears Paul chained to a wall, talking to the anonymous living. And he brings him to Christ. They didn't, when they would get up, they were, they were chained. They were sure. in prison. Yes. And he told him about Jesus Christ. Yes. And he, he accepted Jesus Christ. He believed. Yes. And he was saved at that moment. You know, my father got saved. There's no doubt my father was saved. I was a little child. I want to argue that point. I was four years old. That doesn't matter to me. I was four years old when he got saved. Sure. I can remember some of the things he used to do. He was walking carefully. He gave his life to Christ, and it changed him. Right. That day. And that's what it should do. And then later on, now our church taught water baptism as a way of after you become a believer. It's a sign of your faith. Sign of your salvation. salvation. Sure. So my dad did what they call believer's baptism. Sure. And all that, but he was saved and he was secure way before that. Because the Bible says, it's like Jesus said, I will baptize you with my spirit, and that's what he got when he, when he really broke down and confessed Christ. He was saved. I'm happy that he got baptized later because if we're not going to do what God says, when we'll, then I can make up any rule I want but to. He said that, and what said the who, what, why, when, where that was Jewish, that's all Jewish, right? But you can't stop there, Wendell, and say Acts chapter 2 is primarily Jewish, which I was with you. Really right there, but I, I mean, my Savior, my Savior is, is so great, so mighty. He can save to the automatic. I could be laying in a gutter and reach out and say, Jesus, save me. He could. And you're safe. He could. He could. Now, that, that person, I, I've heard testimonies that, that like that. And people get up, and then they go to church, they learn, they start learning. About, they might get baptized months later, right? but they're still safe. They're still secure. Here, here's my thought again. Rather than argue oh, when the salvation comes, if you do it all, it doesn't matter when the salvation comes. It ain't but my work. It's God's work. It is God's work. No question. But baptism isn't a work. Yes, you do. 
you know, when Paul was walking. Okay, hold on, hold on a second. Go ahead. I don't have to do anything, so you don't have to believe? You have to believe. Well, then you have to do something. Have to See, people who say, I don't have to do anything, always say that when it comes to baptism. They will never deny, well, of course I have to believe. They will never deny, well, of course I have to repent. They will never deny, well, of course I have to confess Christ as my Savior. That's all amazing stuff. But I don't have to be baptized because that's a work. I think it's Christ drawing them to, to himself. It really is. Well, a, sure it is. You say you take Paul. Paul's just walking along the road to Damascus. Yeah, ready to first guess, guess, guess what, Paul? You're going to believe. That's right. Today. That's right. And he Whether does. you want to or not. Oh, that's yeah. not true. No, no, no. Well, no, no, no. He, he picked Paul. He, he chose he Paul. Paul could have said no. He chose um, John the Baptist before he was born. God did, yes. No, he chose did. him. You, you, this, you, your church is the best. Yes, that's called God's sovereignty, as you go now. He was sovereign. He is sovereign, Wendell, but you have a choice just like I do. Yeah, yeah. And just like Paul did. Right. Paul could have said, I don't know who you are that just appeared to me, but I don't give a who. I don't believe in you. The point is, right. Paul had a, an experience which caused him to believe. I understand. Not because God forced him mm -hmm. to believe. Well, it would have forced me to believe. Uh, no, it would convince you that that was the truth, yeah, and you would exactly. believe. Exactly. But if you want to say Paul was forced <coughs> to believe, well, now God's a respect of the person. I don't mean to say it, but what I'm saying okay. is God chose him. No question he chose and him. And it wasn't like Paul saying, you know what, I'm going to believe today. Uh, he, he, made, he made a choice. But God Paul made said, a choice. I agree with you completely. But what did Paul have to do? Paul goes into the city. What does God do? He gets a man named Ananias. And, and, and I see this vision that says, Paul's over here, Saul, and I want you to go talk to him and tell him about who I am. And Ananias says, I'm not on the Heremites from each other, that guy's down here to arrest Christians. Right. And the vision says to him, it's okay, he's my chosen vessel. And so he goes, and Paul will say later on, and we'll see this when we study the book of Acts, Paul will say, what I was told to do is arise and be baptized wash away my sins. Now, when if his sins were already washed away, why did he have to be baptized to have his sins? I don't know, but... I, I, well, say I, I don't either. And that's why my point is, we can argue for... I don't doubt that you're saved. I, would, I, I, don't, I don't need. I don't but either. I also don't doubt anybody who believes in the name of Jesus Christ. It's like say, it's not my work, it's God's work. It is God's work. for me to say whether you're saved or not. It's up to Christ to say whether I'm saved or not. That's Ultimately, true. yes, Wendell. But we have to preach the truth, don't we? I do preach the truth. No, you I can't mean, preach the preach. whole truth and not preach baptism. No. I mean, you can't because it's throughout the New Testament. Here it is right here. Well, it was Christ who said, it wasn't me that said it. It was Christ who said, I baptized in my spirit. Here's but a, even Christ was baptized. Yes. Well, you know, that that was to fulfill, fulfill all prophecies. See, Christ was going to be identified. The Bible says he's going to be identified as a transgressor. And who was being baptized? Sinners. He did that to fulfill prophecy. And he and would be I'll, numbered I'll with the transgressors. But here's one to do. He didn't need to be saved for sure. He certainly didn't need to be saved. But that was that was to show that he was identifying with us as sinners. That was a prophesy that he would be he would be identified with us. That's why he was baptized. Here's what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter twenty eight. Go in all the world, not just the Jews, make disciples. Baptizing them and we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And you know, he told that to his Jewish disciples, and they didn't do it, for the most part. Sure they did. These are those they 11, all those 12. Jerusalem. Because that's what he told them to do, I know. He said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And when you get the Holy Spirit, then you'll do all this stuff. Right. And he, just, what he, just what we read a while ago, he said, you'll be my witnesses well, in Jerusalem. He burst on that. You're right. He said, go, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. So we're in the other most parts of the world. And most of those disciples went all over the place. So it, was made, it wasn't really until Paul comes along. He's the, gospel, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. He was the old missionary journey. Yes, yeah, so. he does. But, but I think the point is this that I'm trying to make. If we don't argue about when I'm saved, and we simply do what the Bible tells us to do, then you're saved. Right? Because a lot of churches will argue, just like we're having this discussion right here. Am I saved before I'm baptized? Am I saved when I confess? Am I saved at my baptism? We can split churches and argue about that so the cows come home and people will have their anecdotes of 
Well, I know my dad was saved and accepted Jesus by confessing him. Okay, I don't have a fight that with you. My point there was, why are we dividing churches by trying to draw a line and say it happens here, happens here, happens here? Why don't we just do what the Bible says do, and then I don't have to worry about have I done what God wants me to do or not? If I've done it, I've done it, and I'm saved. Don't get saved when it does. <laughs> well, the Ethiopian eunuch got saved yeah. in the desert, and yeah. somehow there was water there. Yep. And he said, the Ethiopian eunuch says, see, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? You can't read the book of Acts and yeah. not believe that water baptism. But I think there was a change the in the ministry after Paul comes along. He said, like I said, I came not to no, God. No. But the gospel I'm is not going to let you aware of saying that. Okay. That is not what Paul meant. Because mm -hmm. if you read the rest of Paul's letters, he covers baptism over and over and over again. But, but he just he says, I didn't come to, uh, to preach the gospel. So the good news well, of course he can is preach. Christ crucified. Sure, but you can't read that and say, well, well that was not a Paul and Christ made him on effect. Who are you reading at? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 17 and 18. This when the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, yeah. and those which are saved in the power of God. So he preached the cross. That's what he preached. He preached Christ. Okay, this is this burial. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the Bible that. says you confess your mouth and believe in your heart, mm -hmm. and Romans, you shall be saved. Who's he saved? Who's talking to in Romans? Talking to Romans. He's talking, he's talking to Gentiles there. He's talking to Christians who are saved. Christians. Yeah, who've already been baptized. You believe in your heart. Um, He's talking to Christians who are already. Listen, here's, let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Corinth had a lot of trouble, a lot of divisions, fighting over all kinds of stuff. He says, My brothers, some from Chloe's household, have informed me. That there are quarrels among you. What are they fighting over? This. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Notice he doesn't say the one who baptized. The question is, were you baptized in the name of Paul? So I'm thankful I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you are baptized into my name. You can't just read the I didn't come to baptize line. The argument is who baptized me? And who am I the follower of? And Paul says I'm glad I didn't get caught up in that and baptize a bunch of people so you wouldn't say I got baptized in the name of Paul. He doesn't say don't get baptized. He's quenching the argument. He says, so, but none of you can say that. Yes, I, and then he goes, yes, well, I guess I did baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not according to human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of his power. He <coughs> reading the one line that says, I didn't come to baptize, without reading the context of what is he talking about? He's talking about, he's talking about people who said, I got baptized in the name of Paul. I'm better than you because you got baptized in the name of Brian. That's the argument he's responding to, not that baptism is important. Do you think Christ, in verse 17, do you think Christ would have said that? <coughs> That's the next point. That's the mm -hmm. point. Baptism you is all the passion. I think it would be for well, Christ sent me not only to baptize, but to preach the gospel. I don't know. It just doesn't make Again, sense. I think you got to read the content. The gospel message. The way I read it, the gospel yeah. message is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you need to do what He tells you to do. That's the gospel message. You know, I, I, I can remember my own salvation. And I just remember giving my life to Christ, and sure. He saved me. And okay. I can remember how it wasn't, I just can't, there's no water involved. It's but you got Christ, baptized. I used to baptized, but it, I was baptized when Jesus said, I will baptize you with my spirit. I did get baptized later. Sure you did. It was far later. That's okay. You and did. I died between there. I, I was at peace that I was I was with God. You might have been so sure you're good with God, to be honest with you. I'm sorry you feel that. But you, did. you didn't die, so we're okay. We well, don't have to argue about it. Well, I'm not here on what you had. Right. Okay. That's you're, you're here. here. Right. You're here. Yeah. You know, Paul will say in another passage. We disagree on that. And, and we can. But again, I think we just need to be aware of the Bible teaches.
in this water baptism. And if you're going to argue or, or teach that baptism is not important, then you're saying something the Bible says is not important. That what Jesus said, do. What Paul said, do. What Peter says, do. But it's he, not important. I'm not going to say that's not important. But he said something earlier. But it, and I, I've, I've talked to a lot of people. You know, but you know, a lot of people would get in, in their mind that because they were dunked in some water, that they're okay. That's wrong, too. I, I, I don't teach that either. That. I don't teach and that. I, 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 see, and I, I was with a lady that <coughs> talked to her in the living room, and I asked her about her, her faith. She said, well, I was baptized. I can answer that. Yeah. When, did you, when did you actually need to say this? Yeah. Well, to her, that might be when she did it. But then I agree with that. If you just get baptized for the fun of it because, well, my mom wants me to, that doesn't do you any good. taught that way. Like if you get baptized, you can get baptized. Some teach that. Some teach that. But that's no more that's true than, as, that's as dangerous window as saying, as long as I believe I'm okay. The Bible doesn't teach either one of those. The Bible teaches. How do you, how do you explain the thief with Paul, I mean the uh, Salim guy, on uh, that um, um, slave that was, maybe he ran away You're talking from about him. Onesimus? Onesimus. Okay. okay. He, he, ran, he ran away from his owner. You don't know well, that he, he was. was you don't know that he wasn't baptized. Though. Well, he wasn't baptized right away because he was in prison. You don't know. But I do know he was saved. By him. I knew God. God. You see, that's what I'm saying. That's God's work. Omnibus needed Christ. Paul was chained to a wall. He's chained to a wall next to Paul, luckily, or providentially. Somehow. Providential. Providential. Yeah. And Paul gives him the gospel, and he believes, and he yes. was saved. It's like the act, it's like the room, it's believe in your heart, yeah. and you're sick. We'll talk about this a little bit. But again, I think the key is this. Let's just do what the Bible says to do. And then we don't have to argue about it. Or, or have to argue about it. You know, what chapter are you in? Which chapter are you in? Acts. We're in Acts 2, right? Uh -huh. Okay. And all that believe were together and had all things common, mm -hmm. and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to every man as every man had need. Did we do that today? Probably no, not. We, don't. we do not do that today. Because I, I have less money than probably most of you. But I shouldn't have, according to this verse. Mike says it's great. But anyway, but that, that's uh, one thing. That, that doesn't apply to our, it doesn't apply to, this, this, this does not apply to the, the Gentile church. Well, well, Ringo, Ringo says they sell their possessions and goods. Not going to let you be the word of saying that either. I mean, uh, it does right. apply to the Gentile church. That we're supposed to sell our goods and have everything in common? If you have somebody in need, yeah. Yeah, but that's what it just says. It says Why? And they continue, says that they, they actually sold their possessions and goods and parted to all men as every man has need. Okay, notice the distinction here, Ringo, and then we'll quit. We'll pick this up next week. Yeah. It doesn't say there was a command to sell everything they had. Yeah. But the point here is there were Christians then. Who couldn't afford to live. Mm -hmm. So the Christians who could afford helped them. Not everybody sold everything they had. Other people had homes. We'll read later. Peter goes to his house. These people go to their homes. They didn't everybody sell everything they had. Paul becomes a tent maker and he's going traveling around making tents. Well, how does he do that? Mm -hmm. He sold everything they had. You can't because you don't have any tent making tools. The point here in Acts chapter 2 is the early church took care of each other. Why did they need to do that? Because people who became Christians were ostracized by the Jewish people who didn't believe. Families kicked them out. Store owners fired them. <laughs> In the stores, nobody would shop there anymore because you crazy Christian person have rejected the law of Moses. So you've got a lot of people here who have no way now to make a living. And so the early church, people who did have ways to make a living, did whatever they wanted to do and sold what they could, sold what they needed to, and took care of everybody. Yeah, took care of about my dad, but, uh, I mean, people still do that. Right? We have a benevolence yeah, fund yeah. here at Central Christian Church to help people who have financial difficulties. We still do that. Well, that's, that's I, can my, I can give you my address. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you have some financial need, you can talk. <laughs> Seriously, that's what we have a benevolence. This is the second commandment. Yeah, you can encourage yourself. Yeah, do what you got to do. Because later, and we'll see this in chapter 5 again real quick, when Ananias and Sapphira came and lied about how much they were <coughs> on the board, Peter says to them, well, you owned your land and yours to do with as you wished. It wasn't you were commanded to sell it and give us all the money. It was you could do whatever you
whatever you wanted to with it, but now that you've come to help us out, don't lie about it. Don't make yourself bigger than you are. So it wasn't that everybody in the church sold everything they had. It was the church took care of those who needed help. Same way the church does that today. Well, I, yeah. a lot of people came in to Jerusalem, accepted Christ, and didn't go back home. So yeah. they didn't have any possessions with them or anywhere to live. So that's why they came together to help support each other. I think that's that's true as well, that you have people who come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. They accepted Jesus. They brought enough supplies and stuff maybe to stay a week. They're there potentially forever. And now they've got the money. Now they've got the way to live. So the church in Jerusalem helps them so they, they have a way to live. And again, that's what the church still does today is we help people who need help. And then the widows. Yeah. You know, they, they That's right. We don't have no government social security. That's the thing we do. Take care of who we can take care of. That's the way the church works. But let me just close with this, and that is, I don't want to argue about these things. But if we'll just do what Peter says, do, I don't have to argue about did I get saved when I believe, or did I get saved when I confessed, or did I say a sinner's prayer and accept Christ? It's if I do what I'm told to do. Then I don't have to worry. We don't have to argue about that. We can now spend our time going out into the world and telling other people about Jesus yeah. instead of arguing about when did I get saved? Because that doesn't get us anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, what gets us somewhere is telling other people about Jesus. Paul, oh, last comment. Well, the problem is that people interpret the Bible differently. And that's you absolutely talked about that before. So when you can read a verse or read something like that, and people will take it differently and so on. Yes. And it, that, that's one of the problems. And that's why I say people who believe differently than I do. I have no doubt they're sincere. They very much the truth. They very much believe what they're teaching. But we can't both be right. Because some of them are diametrically opposed to one thing or another. And one of them's got to be wrong. But some of them can mesh enough together, like what you and I are talking about right now. And if we'll just do what the Bible says do, I'm not going to argue that I get saved as soon as I believe, or they get saved when I get baptized. It doesn't matter. I did it all the way the Bible says do it all. And that other, and we'll look at this next week as well. Right after Paul's and Peter's sermon is over, he says, And those who believe were baptized. Well, and that's the thing I would say about that now since you left him up there. Instead of me saying, I did all. My mother wanted to quite did all. Christ does do it all.
Yeah. yeah. She went to the doctor. They ain't got some meds. So happy for that. Hopefully it'll kick in pretty quick and make a little bit of sense. I suppose we we'll keep praying about my knee so I'm hurting. <coughs> yes. Tough getting old. Anybody else? You may want to pray for John. Then we'll take that lunch maybe next week. <laughs> we'll be good. Anybody want to pray for him? That's right. need it. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word and thank you for the study we've had. God, I just pray that we'll study and learn and discuss and that you'll lead us into the truth and all in all, we'll just do what you want us to do. Thank you for being the Savior that you are. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for providing for us the way you do. God, I do a list of those we've mentioned tonight for Katie and for Mista and for Deb and for me and God, you know there's others in our congregation who need help as well, and some are sitting in this room, and we've not named them by name, but you know who they are, and so God, we just ask your grace to be with all of us. Help us to feel better, help us to live better, and help us to trust you more, no matter what's going on in our lives. Thank you for all that you do for us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. The neat thing is...